Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the Universal Hall. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Anna. Anna Breitenbrach. Anna's traveled from South Africa to be with us, and um, let's give her a warm welcome, please. Right, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to come and learn about talking with the animals. Although it's not just animals I'm going to be speaking with you about, officially what I do is called interspecies communication. And that's not a foreign concept to Findhorn for very obvious reasons to do with, well, about 50 years ago, 50 years and some months. Interspecies communication is something that we all can do, so I'm not here to be regarded as you know, special or having been dropped on my head as a baby. It's about us all connecting with this uh, intuitive ability we have within ourselves. We may happen to have a particular passion for animals or plants, perhaps the trees or even the elements like the oceans. And this form of communication really applies in so many different ways. So I'm going to talk just for a brief 20 minutes about some of the what it is and how it works. And then we're going to show 15 minutes from a recently completed documentary involving uh, an animal communication case with a black leopard. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the story already and some may not. After the showing of those brief 15 minutes of film footage, we're then going to leave a good 45 minutes for questions and answers from the audience, discussion style, because often I find that's the most helpful. That's where you have the real life situations you might be wondering about back at home, in your gardens or in your homes that you'd like to ask about. And we can all learn from each other. So don't be shy at that time to make your comments or ask your question. Everyone in the room will benefit from hearing that discussion. So without any further ado, I'm going to pop to and fro a few times for advancing the slides. But let me start with some of the founding statements that underpin our modern way of thinking, rather unfortunately. Aristotle, one of our fathers of philosophy, has implied that nature is just here for our purpose. And Rene Descartes, one of the founding fathers of our modern scientific system, has had very similar things to say, calling ourselves humans the lords and possessors of nature. And this is where we humans, well, even before then, actually, this is where we began to separate from and try to regard ourselves as better than the other species. We use technology, we use our brain size and functioning as, as arguments to support this theory. But it's just a theory. It's just a theory that we made up, that there's some imaginary hierarchy of life, and we happen to be at the very top of this hierarchy. But no one else said it was so, except ourselves. So it hardly seems very objective, does it? At these very critical times, we know for all sorts of reasons that the Earth and our fellow beings, our wild relatives and those that live closer to us are really struggling under the so-called supremacy of our human species. And a whole different way is going to have to be founded. Einstein was a very, very wise man beyond his mathematics and his physics. He really understood that when you take science to its limit, you eventually come up against something more. You come up against something bigger than the empirical and measurable sciences. And he knew, and we are now experiencing, that we have to invent a whole new way of thinking and being and relating to get through this evolutionary crisis, else we're just going to drag all the other species down with us. So what, what is this world that we're actually living in? It's not physical. It's not about the way flowers look. It's not about how many legs an animal has. It's not even about a teacup or a person. Really, on a building block level, we are all made up of exactly the same stuff, which isn't actually stuff, it's energy. But at a quantum level, whether it's a leaf or a coffee mug or a person, we are just collections of quanta that come together to form atoms, which come together to form molecules, which come together to form increasingly complex beings. But at the fundamental building block level, we are all made up of exactly the same stuff. And so why wouldn't we be, ab we be able to connect and communicate with other expressions of life? We are literally of the same energy. We are cut from the same cloth. We humans having brains as we do tend to think 
a lot, too much, <laughs> and every thought or feeling has an electromagnetic consequence in our brain. The synapses fire, there are brainwave emissions, and these really have a frequency that can be perceived by any other aspect of the universe that tunes into us much like a cell phone tower or a radio tower that's constantly emitting waves. So we too, as humans, are walking through our days and the world emitting these, these waves energetically and on a, on a brain level. But connecting with any other being we want to is not just a matter of the mind or this lump of gray matter we call our brain. It's also a matter of the heart, the wisdom of the heart, that feeling of unconditional love, and connecting from a place of kinship and recognition. So I'll talk more about that in a moment. The good news is that other animals, non-human animals, are automatically tuned in. They're very open. We know how our cats and dogs at home just know what we're thinking. And if we're feeling sad or bad on a particular day, they might come and show us a little comfort or, or treat us a little differently. Unfortunately, us modern humans have lost the ability to be aware of these things naturally. And we tend to focus only on spoken word and on language, but the animals all around us are constantly sensing us and they know things automatically. They're very good at it. It's us who needs to adjust our frequency to get on the same wavelength as them. But animals are always receiving our real thoughts and feelings, and perhaps they're even suggesting some things to us as well. <laughs> if you're sitting at home and suddenly have a thought pop into your head, <laughs> you might be sitting in front of the TV or at your computer and suddenly you find yourself getting up and walking through the kitchen, outside into the yard, picking up the empty dog's water bowl and filling it with water. It doesn't mean that you suddenly had the bright idea in the middle of your work day that the dog might be thirsty. What would have happened is that your thirsty dog is emitting these feelings and messages of thirst and eventually you manage to get it on an energetic or a telepathic level. So animals are good at this, they're doing it all the time. These photos were taken on a wild um, dolphin workshop a couple of years back where completely wild dolphins in the ocean choose to come up to swimmers and interact with us. And they have learned that us humans tend to be pretty silly about things and to think of contact as meaning physical contact of some kind. Look at how many cultures, isn't there the shaking of hands or at the very least eye contact as some way of making connection because we humans think that physical contact is the only way to make connection. And what I've experienced with these dolphins is that they know they're connected energetically, but when they come close to us, they emit the air bubbles out of their blowhole that is their signature pattern. Each dolphin has a little autograph that is a certain pattern of bubbles. And when they come and greet a person for the first time, they always emit their particular autograph as if to say, hi, I'm Dolly. <laughs> So animals are always adjusting to come into our ways of connecting. They know it's possible to connect energetically. It's really us humans who always think about things quite so physically. Quantum theory and Einstein's relativity theory talk a lot about how this energy transference is possible. And I'm not going to go into that too much now because there's lots and lots of reading material about it. But essentially by directing our attention to another being, we have the ability to tune in and to be on the same wavelength. There's no accident in that expression. It's not just coincidental to say, be on the same wavelength as someone. It really means you're resonant. That's what attunement is all about. Our, our ancient ancestors knew about this very well. They didn't have to wake up in the morning and sit down in front of their fire and go into a deep meditation to try to connect with the animals. They just simply woke up and thought about the lion in Africa or thought about the kangaroo in Australia and would automatically get information coming into their minds spontaneously about where those animals were. People too, when they were hunter-gatherers, used to know about the plants in these intuitive ways. They would know by direct communication with the plants which plants might be medicinal and be useful for healing and well-being which might be toxic or which parts of the plant might be toxic and which might be nourishment as food. And the medicine people of the tribe and the hunters and gatherers would communicate with the plants to ask them about their properties and they would care for the plants. Our indigenous hunter-gatherer ancestors would also communicate with the collective consciousness of a certain species of animals. So if they wanted to go hunting tomorrow, 
Then tonight they would sit in a state of prayer or communication, perhaps with the Kudu nation, and humbly through prayer communicate with all Kudu in the area and request, very respectfully request that one Kudu please show its tracks the next morning so they could follow the tracks because they really needed to feed their family for the next few months. They would always explain their need in a very humble way and never take more than they needed. And then about 12,000 years ago, we humans decided to keep animals behind fences and to grow crops and keep them also, keep more than we needed. And when we started hoarding and keeping more than we needed, we began to make them just resources for ourselves and not be in such a dynamic relationship and respectful relationship with them. There are still some indigenous cultures that carry forward these ways of honoring animals. In Nepal, there's a, an annual day of the dog where all dogs are honored. And everybody puts outside their homes water and food for the stray dogs to come and enjoy. And if the dogs come close enough, they decorate them with garlands of flowers and put turmeric on their foreheads and really revere and honor the animals. So too, there were very close relationships between the indigenous people in Africa and the wild animals too. These days, unfortunately, when we see documentaries, they usually are pitting man against beast and trying to make some big sensational battle of the whole thing, predator and prey. But at the times before modern times, there was a dynamic relationship and a very beautiful way of being and even physical closeness was possible. Not that you should try this at home. <laughs> So what is telepathy? It is direct communication. It's direct communication. The animal might be in the same room as you. The plant might be right in front of you in your garden. It's direct communication. You're not using some distant means of doing a psychic reading. It's a direct communication, like a conversation. And the dog will know that you're speaking with them telepathically, just as you will know. It's a two-way sending and receiving of information. It's completely natural. We know how sometimes we can just tell what someone's going to say before they say it. That's telepathy. So it's not something very new agey or weird or a special gift. We're not predicting the future. We're not in some astral traveling way, um, zooming ourselves over to remote locations to look down and see what's happening there. If we are connecting with an animal who is somewhere else than where we are, we're actually connecting energetically and then asking them to show us where they are or how they're feeling. It's all about directing our attention and our intention. For us humans, that often means eye contact. Some animals don't like eye contact. They take it as threatening, um, or they think it's a game, you know. So it doesn't have to be eye contact, but with animals who live close to people, like our domestic pets, they can often enjoy eye contact for short periods. With our eyes closed, we can still direct our intention to connect towards the one we want to connect with. Animals and plants are sentient beings. Now, a sentient being means one that can think for itself and is self-aware, very much aware of itself, of its individual expression in the universe. Unfortunately, mostly science doesn't really regard animals as conscious beings, so they go through all sorts of experiments to try to, to prove that. Cornell University had a study with elephants who have lived in the same yard in a zoo for several years. And one day they took the elephants away and sedated them and put a cross, a white cross, on the elephant's forehead, like you can see. They also put up a big seven-meter mirror in the elephant's yard, and then they woke the elephants up. And when the elephants were no longer sleepy, they went out into their yard, and of course they went straight to the mirror, thinking, oh, new toy, you know, and they felt with their trunks behind the mirror. But within 90 seconds, they realized they could see their reflection in the mirror. And when they saw their reflection, the first thing the elephants did was with their trunks move to the cross on their own forehead and try to wipe away the mark. So this proves that they were understanding their reflection to be a two-dimensional representation of themselves and in reverse, you know, a mirror image. They didn't first try to wipe on the mirror. They straight away realized, whoa, there's something there that shouldn't be there and try to wipe the mark away with their own trunks. So animals are self-aware. Every bee in a beehive is aware of its own role and its own purpose. Every tree in a forest is very aware of its family of other trees and of itself, of its own needs and its own life. 